Hi, everybody. I hope we're live this time. Um, I'm here today with Dr. Colleen Kelly, and uh, her research and clinical practice focuses on fecal microbiota transplantation to treat C. diff. Um, she's one of the principal investigators for an NIH-funded national registry answering essential questions around the world, around real-world efficacy and safety of, of FMT. Uh, Dr. Kelly has assisted other physicians and institutions worldwide in developing FMT protocols and collaborates regionally, nationally, internet, and internationally with other physicians and scientists who have clinical and research interests in FMT, intent, intending to move this novel treatment forward. In addition, she's co-authored the current FMT guidelines. She speaks and serves on the Scientific Advisory Board for the American Gastroenterological Association Center for Gut Microbiome Research and Education. All right, Dr. Kelly, sorry about Thank that. Yeah, now let me just turn my let's slide try again. Here. Hopefully we get them working. Everybody can see those. So let's talk poop. Yeah. So um, hopefully you guys can see my introductory slide here with my name and affiliations. My name is Colleen Kelly. I'm an associate professor of medicine. I'm at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University and with uh, Lifespan Physician Group Gastroenterology Practice. And I'm going to talk to you today about the human gut microbiome and how we can target all of the microorganisms living in the gut uh, to treat disease. These are my disclosures, just some trials and things I'm involved with. Um, the outline, what I'm going to kind of talk to you about today, first of all, we're going to start out with just a human gut microbiome 101, talk about the composition, development, and function of all of the microorganisms inside of us. Uh, we're going to talk about different diseases associated with alterations in gut microbiota, and then consider how maybe manipulating these gut microbiota may have a role in the treatment of human disease. So we're going to start off like simply what is poop? I didn't put a big gross picture of poop to uh, everybody probably just had lunch. But you know, we all kind of heard it's mostly water, about 75%, and then about 25% solid matter. And um, a third of that solid matter is uh, things like sloughed cells and, and secretions and mucus. But a good 30% of that is uh, bacteria and other microorganisms. So it makes up a, a great portion of the solid matter in our stool. And knowing what bacteria are there, our, our kind of knowledge around that, um, started out, you know, with traditional microbiology. And we all remember maybe from college going in and, and plating off bacteria. And you can basically grow different bacteria depending on, you know, that you're feeding them what they want to eat and you're growing them in the conditions that they normally grow in terms of temperature or presence of oxygen. And this can be, you know, somewhat cumbersome. Um, you have to kind of know what you're looking for. Um, and this was the way that we looked at the, you know, what was inside of our guts for many, many years. Um, but we know only about 20% of those bacteria are easily culturable. And it's kind of the tip of the iceberg idea where the majority of the gut microbiome or these gut bacteria were, um, you know, not known to be present or not recognized to be present because they were either non-culturable or very, very difficult to, um, to bring about in culture. And then about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, there was a really game-changing technology. It's this field of metagenomics. And basically, it relies on the presence of a 16S ribosomal RNA gene. This gene is present in all bacteria, and it has conserved as well as very variable regions. And it's these variable regions that differ between organisms. And they can use DNA sequencing technologies that allow them to examine these regions without needing to cultivate the bacteria. So you don't need to cultivate them and grow them. You just need to have, you know, various primers and know what you're, you know, kind of directed towards uh, these different areas on the gene. And more closely related bacteria have very much more similar variable regions. And if uh, bacteria that are kind of considered one species or an OTU, operational taxonomic unit, are 97% similar in their, uh, their uh, genomic material. And the um, NIH recognized the importance of this technology and how, um, and, and really capitalized on it with the establishment of the Human Microbiome Project in 2008. And they basically threw a lot of money at characterizing the human gut microbiome and funding studies that were um, related to this. And they took uh, healthy volunteers and characterized not just the gut bacteria and uh, but bacteria in all parts of the body, including like the nares, the oral pharynx, uh, urogenital region and skin, um, as well as others. And really kind of a lot of publications came out of this that really increased our understanding um, many fold over that period of time. And what's we, you know, you might've 
you know, heard this referred to that the number of bacterial cells in our gut is actually equal to the number of human cells in our body, about 30 trillion. And there is about 150 times more bacterial DNA in our body, the bacterial DNA than our human DNA. Um, so um, this is just a picture of kind of one of the, you know, if you were to read a paper on the microbiome and some of the ways that um, we describe uh, the, the microbiome or findings um, in, in scientific literature. And one thing you'll see sometimes is this principal coordinate analysis. And it's basically just a way of kind of showing, and it looks two dimensional here, but it's really kind of a three dimensional, if you imagine it had some depth uh, graph where you can compare microbial communities um, in or between different samples. So, and you see here, we had farmers and non-farmers, their nasal um, swabs um, and their oral swabs. And they kind of look, you know, they each have a different color represented here. And it just kind of shows that, you know, the nasal communities of the farmers, you know, microbiome cluster farther away than their oral communities of a non-farmer. And, you know, it's just basically, uh, you know, a, a helpful way to um, understand differences um, in between samples. Um, another thing that you may see in these papers is talking about richness and diversity. So we know in the, at least in the gut, um, richness and diversity are very good. And this was a paper that came out a couple of months ago on COVID infected patients versus non-COVID infected patients. And one thing talks about species richness, and this is really the number of unique bacterial species found in a sample. And um, you can see the COVID were slightly less than the non-COVID. And then they also have this Shannon diversity index that you'll sometimes see. And that takes into account not just the richness, like the number of different organisms, but the abundance of the different species as well. And that's uh, kind of a tricky calculation here, but a graph kind of showing what a Shannon diversity uh, index plot might look like. So our human micro microbiome, we talk about bacteria a lot um, because that's what you know we know the most about. We know there's at least a thousand species of bacteria, but there are also other microorganisms present as well, including archaea, which are kind of single cell prokaryotes that um, live in very unusual environments. Sometimes they're these things that you find in like gas vents of, you know, under, you know, under the sea and things like this. Um, also viruses, bacteriophages, which are uh, viruses that infect bacteria, fungi, and even protozoa in some places. And the thing to think about with your microbiome is it's kind of like a fingerprint. It's very unique between people. And each of these down here represents a different sample from a different person. And the one thing to kind of point out is that everybody's similar in the sense that you get these big, broad blue bands. And what those represent are Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes phyla. And these dominate the normal human gut, probably about 80 to 85%. And these are anaerobic organisms. Other things that you'll find are proteobacteria. That's represented by pink here. You see this narrow pink band. Um, this is the things like E. coli, Salmonella, Helicobacter, like Helicobacter pylori, and this smaller band of Acinetobacter. And these are actually soil microorganisms. As you can see, nobody's not a clone of each other. People have variable amounts of each of these uh, phyla. And the composition of the bacteria varies through our life cycle. Um, it's been a little controversial, but for the most part, let's say the baby inside the mother is sterile, um, doesn't really have much of a microbiome at all. And then at the time of delivery starts to kind of starts to acquire um, those bacteria. And a lot of that depends on the mode of delivery. So babies born by vaginal delivery are picking up a lot of lactobacillus and things from the mother's birth canal and rectum. Um, babies born by C-section may initially become more colonized with things from the hospital environment, like um, microbes that are found on, you know, skin or on like the nurse's hands. Um, types of feeding make a difference. So babies that are born by, you know, fed by breast versus bottle or, or uh, formula um, may have different compositions. Uh, whether the baby's premature, spends a lot of time in the hospital or the NICU or gets a lot of antibiotics would obviously make a difference. Then by about age three, things become a lot more stable. And um, kind of it's these long middle years where we are colonized by those bacteria that I just showed you on the, the previous slide. Um, though there's thought to be distinct enterotypes and this is heavily influenced by diet. And we know the Western diet is terrible, you know, much, uh, a lot of fats, a lot of animal proteins, a lot of carbs and, and sugars. And we see much less diversity of the microbiome in the West um, versus cultures that maybe eat a lot more fiber. Um, and we, these bacteria inside of um, those that eat a Western diet are more capable of helping us digest simple carbs and starches. 
Then in the um, elderly population, as people get more and more frail, um, you start to see increased numbers of facultative anaerobes, the diversity goes down, and that whole ecosystem becomes somewhat compromised. And um, you, know, you gotta kind of think of the gut microbiome as an organ system in and of itself. It has a lot of really um, important functions. Um, number one, defense. Um, it can inhibit uh, pathogens from colonizing or caught making us sick. Um, it produces actually, bacteria can produce things called bacteriosins that are like uh, antibiotics that they kind of kill off each other with. They can degrade toxins of other organisms or deplete other essential nutrients that, you know, kind of competitive organisms are, are unable to exist without those nutrients. Um, it helps us with digestion. So, you know, degrading starch or, or fiber in our diet, um, production of certain vitamins like vitamin uh, B12, vitamin K. Um, the immune system development is another very important uh, function. We've got, you know, in the, especially in the first two years of life, as that microbiome is being established, there's a lot of bi-directional interactions happening between our immune system in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which is in sort of the distal small bowel. And that helps determine which bacteria colonize the baby. And the baby becomes tolerant to certain types of bacteria. You think about it, how does your gut know what should be there? What's a commensal? What's a pathogen? All of that happens during this critical window. And it's thought that maybe disturbances during that window may be playing a part in a lot of immune diseases like food allergies, atopic dermatitis, asthma. Um, and finally, gut microbiome is known to different bacteria can um, impact drug metabolism. And this becomes important, particularly like there's some cancer chemotherapies that people's response may depend on the presence or absence of certain bacteria. So I thought this is very complicated. And so obviously it's much more complicated than some are good, some are bad. It's much more compl complex than that, but what can go wrong? <laughs> so I wanna introduce this concept of dysbiosis because I'm gonna use the word a lot. And basically it's alterations in gut bacteria that are kind of pathologic alterations. And what happens, you know, you normally in the state of health have these diverse and abundant bacteria, microbiota, they're very rich, very diverse. Um, a lot of firmicutes, bacteroidetes that are these anaerobes. These anaerobes help um, digest fiber and produce short chain fatty acids. Those short chain fatty acids nourish the, the intestinal cells and the cells of the colon. And then those uh, intestinal cells create a nice thick mucus layer that basically keeps them just out of reach of the bacteria themselves. So it's like almost like a little blanket over the cells. Um, then you may have something happen. Antibiotics may disrupt things. Um, certain inflammatory conditions of the gut, like inflammatory bowel disease, necrotizing enterocolitis in babies, disrupts these bacteria. The microbiota be diversity becomes reduced. You start seeing decreased numbers of these beneficial anaerobes and more opportunistic pathogens. That whole process of production of short chain fatty acids becomes skewed. Therefore, the cells become malnourished. They stop producing as much mucus. The bacteria come into direct contact with the cells and incite inflammatory response this kind of idea is a, of a leaky gut. Um, one study I thought was interesting done a couple of years ago now just showed how dietary emulsifier, emulsifiers can induce colitis and the metabolic syndrome in mice. And emulsifiers are ubiquitous. They're found in everything that has a shelf life, particularly ice cream, peanut butter, any kind of baked goods. It's what kind of keeps um, things from separating out and keeps fats from separating out. And it's thought that potentially ingesting amounts of these emulsifiers might have something to do with the situation of dysbiosis and inflammation in our guts. And so they fed uh, laboratory mice kind of normal, the equivalent of like what would be a normal intake of emulsifiers. Um, guar gum is one if you're ever reading the side of a, of a package. And they found that these emulsifiers are capable of breaking down that mucus layer and allowing gut bacteria to translocate and kind of creating a dysbiosis that would induce colitis in mice that were um, prone to that, as well as features of the metabolic syndrome like obesity and um, alterations in lipid metabolism. So um, I'm gonna just go to a case. This is very typical of a patient I see. Um, it's a 54 year old woman. Um, she came in with several days of severe watery diarrhea and crampy pain. She was having eight to 10 explosive bowel movements a day. She was having accidents because she couldn't make it to the toilet on time, waking up in the middle of the night. And on history, it was notable that she'd recently seen the dentist and had a dental abscess and was prescribed a course of clindamycin um, to take for 10 days. Um, 
she looked really toxic. I advised her to go to the hospital where she was found to be dehydrated, volume depleted. Um, she had a very high white blood cell count and her stools were positive for C. difficile infection um, by PCR testing. Uh, she was treated with a course of oral vancomycin, then symptoms resolved over the next few days. So I would argue that, okay, so this patient has C. diff, Clostridioides difficile. And I would argue that C. diff is probably the most basic example of how dysbiosis can result in human disease. So um, C. diff infections occur when exposure to antibiotics, or most typically when exposure to antibiotics alters the indigenous flora and permits this bacteria to colonize and proliferate. And something prompts it to turn on toxin production. And this toxin, there's toxins A and toxin B, they um, create injury to the cells of the colon. Um, a lot of inflammation, and um, there are more virulent strains that produce greater amounts of toxins. So those patients um, have been found to you know, get much sicker, may end up being hospitalized. Um, there can be a spectrum of uh, disease severity from just mild diarrhea to like severe fulminant infections where people end up in intensive care or you know, lose their colon or die. And C. difficile was on the rise or is on the rise. Um, when I was a medical student and a resident, everyone looked you know, older. They'd spent a lot of time in the hospital. They'd gotten a lot of antibiotics. Um, but now we're seeing you know, younger patients in the community who may not have ever even had a dose of, of uh, antibiotics. Um, we're seeing children who were previously thought to be somewhat um, immune or you know, didn't get C. diff. Now we're seeing children and babies who do. These are my kids. They're now 16. and. 13, but this is when they were still really cute. Um, and uh, we, you know, the one thing that we're seeing, you know, we're starting to, this was a, a graph from 2001 up through 2012, and you can see there was a steady climb. Um, but we're seeing more multiply recurrent infections where people get C. diff kind of over and over and can't seem to shake it. And this is a big pop problem. Um, it adds a lot of cost to a hospitalization if a patient develops C. diff. And as I said, we're now not just seeing patients in the hospital, we're now seeing about a third of cases of C. diff are community acquired. And it's always kind of funny, this is a disease that we know is caused by antibiotics. And our first line therapy for it is antibiotics. And these are antibiotics with specific activity against Clostridium difficile. Um, one of these is the cheapest probably option is Flagyl or metronidazole, though that's not a good choice in more severe infections and people, you know, there have been reports of resistance to this. So for more severe infections, we usually start with uh, vancomycin, oral vancomycin, or, uh, or fidaxomycin. And fidaxomycin, the, the disadvantage here is it probably costs about 10 times as much as vancomycin. Uh, but it has some uh, advantages in that it's thought to be more narrow spectrum and targeted to just hit the C. diff and not you know, do collateral damage to other gut bacteria. And um, as I kind of showed that graph, this recurrency diff is a big problem. So you've got about a 20% chance of C. diff coming back after successful treatment of an initial infection. And it usually comes back within days to a couple of weeks uh, where they'll come back with the same symptoms and need to be treated again. But once it's recurred once, you've got about a 40% chance that it's gonna recur a second time. Once you've had a second recurrence, that goes up to about 60% and so on. And you see some people who are in this endless cycle of recurrence where they really um, can't break out of it and they become somewhat like vancomycin dependent and really kind of start to run out of options. So fecal microbiota transplant, and it is through C. diff that I got involved with this work. Um, it's, it used to be called stool transplant or a long time ago fecal bacterial therapy, but this is the common terminology right now. Um, it's the administration of feces that contain that entire gut microbial community from a human donor to affect the microbiota biota of a recipient. Um, it's thought to work by restoring that diversity of microorganisms, particularly those beneficial anaerobes, the firmicutes, the bacteroidetes that produce those short chain fatty acids like butyrate. You, get, you engraft new bacteria from your donor but also um, bacteria that were kind of still present in the recipient, but at a very low level and very compromised, it seems to augment them coming back and they kind of bloom back. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here's just some uh, a picture. This is the Shannon diversity index here. This shows um, diversity of the donor and the patient before FMT and the patient after FMT. And you can see prior to FMT, the diversity, uh, the diversity index here is very low. And then post FMT, it comes more to resemble that of a healthy donor without diarrhea. And this is kind of a graphic depiction of, you know, what are the bacteria that change? And here's the donor and then the patient pre-FMT and post-FMT. And you can see the donor and the pre-FMT samples, you know, each of these lines represents a different sample. They vary very much um, in that the donor had these big, 
green and blue bands with those bacteroides and firmicutes that were missing and are very much decreased in the recipients pre-FMT. And they had more of these proteobacter. And you may remember these are the ones that are normally present in about 5% of the organisms, but they become dominant. Post-FMT, they don't become clones of their donor, but they get that normal sort of healthy profile back uh, with those anaerobes. And the way I'd kind of describe it to patients, um, your gut, you know, in the throes of these recurrency diff infections, it's like a kind of deforested area or, you know, something, a, an area after a forest fire or after, you know, some kind of herbicide was put on it. There's just nothing alive. There's nothing there. And post FMT, within a very short amount of time, you're restoring all of that richness and diversity and abundance of all those microorganisms. That whole ecosystem is, uh, is brought back. Um, this is um, kind of a complicated slide, but I won't go too much into it. You know, that's a very simplistic way of saying to patients what's happening. Um, we're starting to understand more on the, you know, the, the microscopic level how FMT works. And we know these gut microbiota um, are very important in breaking down fiber and develop in these short chain fatty acids that are really necessary for gut health. When they're not present, this pathway is disturbed and you're already having a lot of inflammation that's kind of encouraging C. diff to stick around. Um, gut bacteria can produce these bacteriophages that will you know, attack the pathogen C. diff or produce bacteriosins that will also kind of uh, uh, cause damage and you know, kill off the C. diff. But the most, um, the, the area with the most interest right now is it, it's uh, the area of bile acid metabolism and your liver secretes primary bile acids. Um, these are involved in fat digestion. Uh, when they make it to the colon, uh, normally gut bacteria in the colon convert them to secondary bile acids. That process is completely disrupted in cases of recurrency diff where you'll see these secondary bile acids just aren't present in the colon and it's all primary bile acids. And the reason that's important is Primary bile acids are actually used in culture media to grow C. diff. They're very, very, um, uh, they promote germination and growth of that organism. So it's almost as if one becomes, uh, their gut becomes a human culture dish to just perpetuate this growth of C. diff, whereas secondary bile acids inhibit the growth of C. diff. So by restoring this kind of normal metabolism and the secondary bile acids in the colon, you're really kind of cutting off that vicious cycle. And the real game-changing uh, time here in FMT was 2013, and that was when the first randomized controlled clinical trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this was came out of the Netherlands. It was a small study, it was about 42 patients, and they had had a C. difficile recurrence after getting just at least one course of, of therapy. Um, the intervention there was that they either got um, a standard course of oral vancomycin for two weeks. Uh, with or without a bowel lavage, bowel lavage being like a bowel prep, like you would do for a colonoscopy. And, the, inter and uh, the, the other group got a much more shorter course of vancomycin, followed by a bowel lavage and an FMT. And the way they administered their FMT was through um, a nasoduodenal tube. So they placed these tubes in patients and they put about 500 cc's of a fecal slurry. So that's quite a bit, like half a liter. Um, this study was actually stopped at the interim analysis by their ethics board because of the high efficacy of FMT. And you can see a first infusion of donor feces, 81% effective versus 20 to 30% of the standard of care. Um, when they had some patients who failed, got a second dose, and it got up to about 94% efficacy with FMT. So their ethics board said it's actually not even right to continue to give people this inferior treatment. Um, I subsequently conducted a clinical trial uh, with uh, Larry Brandt in Montefiore at a medical center, um, looking at uh, colonoscopically delivered FMT versus nasoduodenal tube. And we also found uh, efficacy upwards over 90% um, compared to uh, about 40% overall in patients who were just treated with courses of vancomycin alone. So um, I think Dana mentioned I'm involved with the AGA and we have an NIH grant to um, have this national FMT patient registry. We aim to enroll 4,000 recipients to look at like both short and long-term safety and effectiveness. But the initial results of the first 259 patients we enrolled were published last year. And likewise, in a real world setting at a lot of different sites, different patients, different doctors, efficacy is high, 90% at 30 days and 96% of these people remain cured at six months. So it seems a very kind of a robust cure. And short-term safety data was good. Um, usually any kind of symptoms post-FMT were very mild and self-limited. 
um, the complications we had, well, several were related to the procedures that were used to deliver the FMT. Um, there didn't uh, appear to be FMT related uh, infections or deaths. So this is a very basic, and this isn't a whole FMT lecture, it's just to kind of tell you basically what we do. And you have to identify and screen a donor. Um, basically, you're looking for healthy, low risk people, um, no recent antibiotics. They can't really have any medical problems that might even theoretically impact their gut microbiome. Can't be on a lot of medications. Um, you're looking mostly at fairly young, healthy people. Um, and then they are tested, both uh, serologic testing and stool testing for all kinds of infections, including the obvious HIV, hepatitis, uh, syphilis, um, stool testing for various pathogens like salmonella. And this with time has increased and increased. When I first started doing FMT, I used to use uh, donors that were just related family members or friends. And we had a you know, pretty simple battery of tests. Um, but now that it's really evolved and um, the numbers of pathogens and drug resistant infections and things that we're testing for, um, it, it's gotten pretty, um, it's gotten to be a pretty big panel. Um, you then collect and prepare that fecal material in some way. This is kind of an example when I used to do a lot more fresh stool FMT. Um, donor would bring in the sample. I would get a bottle of saline, pour about half of it out, use a plastic spoon, spoon to uh, scoop a couple spoonfuls in, shake it up, and then draw it into these syringes. Um, it's then administered to the patient somehow. And there's um, upper GI roots, like through those nasointestinal tubes, um, a really simple ways by enema. Um, though that only goes up so far. And then the way I do it is by colonoscopy. So I do a colonoscopy, I'm able to get a look at the colon, get to the far side of the colon, and then, you know, kind of squirt the stuff right in. Um, more recently, a lot of um, people are really excited about capsules though, which makes it obviously so much easier without procedural risks or mess. <coughs> so what are the risks? Uh, even though we're putting in billions of microorganisms, um, the risk of infection appears pretty low. Um, we conducted uh, about, gosh, about eight years ago now, a uh, retrospective multi-center study looking at 80 high-risk immunocompromised people. And these were people who had cirrhosis, they were on dialysis, they were on chemotherapy, they had HIV, they were on various immunosuppressant drugs. And in those patients uh, treated with FMT for C. diff, none developed a related infection. Um, in 5,000 outcome reports by Open Biome, which is a big stool bank that um, gives stool, they only had five episodes of bacteremia, and it wasn't clear whether those were, were definitely related, but they, you know, five out of 5,000. Um, there have been fatal aspiration pneumonias with delivering through the upper GI tract through those nasal, nasal intestinal tubes, so it's not really a way that I like to use. Um, there was a really high profile series of cases that came out of Mass General where two extended spectrum beta lactamase E. coli infections, these are these multi drug resistant infections, were transmitted to immunocompromised recipients and um, one of them died. And this happened because the donor was infected with those and hadn't been screened for those. And there was, there's been other um, less serious E. coli infection transmissions reported. You can also get procedural complications. Actually, the only colonoscopic perforation I've had in my entire 16 years of practice was doing an FMT. So those do happen. Um, but, you know, the, the theoretical risks that people worry more about, you know, are we doing, are we mad scientists here doing things that we don't understand and, you know, creating whole new, um, you know, these whole new microbiomes in people? Can this, can this maybe lead to diseases that they may not have otherwise been inflicted with, you know, autoimmune diseases, obesity? I always wonder, you know, when I hear this argument, Antibiotics also very drastically alter gut microbiome. Even um, nobody ever kind of holds them to that as as high of a standard. Um, but you know what I really do worry about is unrecognized pathogens. You know, hepatitis C was out there for a long time in the blood supply before we realized what it was. And so, is there some similar pathogen that we could be transmitting that we don't even know about right now because we're not looking for it? So that's why the work like the registry is really important to do. Um, and there are a lot of associations between our microbes and health. So I said C. diff was the most basic example, but we know that dysbiosis has been described in a myriad of conditions. Obviously GI things like inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac, um, but also autoimmune conditions, atopic conditions like asthma and allergies and um, autism. What I'm kind of gonna to talk to you a little bit about later today, other neurologic diseases like Parkinson's disease. So all of these have um, in various studies shown to have uh, uh, some element of dysbiosis that's associated. What we have to know is just because there's an association 
doesn't mean there's a causality. So, you know, just because they may have a dysbiosis, that may not be causing the disease, maybe some result of the disease. So um, that remains to be determined for, for many of the, the things on this list. So I'm going to talk a little bit about inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, because this is, I'm a gastroenterologist, and this is one of my um, clinical practice areas. Um, it's uh, got a lot of factors involved. Certainly patients who have it have a genetic predisposition to immune dysregulation, and they start to um, you know, the immune cells in their gut start to recognize the bacteria that are present in the gut as the enemy, and they upregulate a lot of inflammation. Um, there, and that inflammation causes a lot of tissue damage um, that results in the symptoms and you know, and the problems they develop. There's definitely environmental factors like smoking and NSAIDs and certain foods that we think may impact the course of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and the microbes, though, we've always known them to be important, but it's only really within, you know, since the emergence of FMT and all of this science that we're starting to wonder, is this potentially a target for therapies? You know, our therapies to date have really been kind of focusing on modifying these environmental factors and giving people immunosuppressant medications. But can we do something here? And here's another PCO plot. There was a reason I showed you that one at the beginning. It just shows uh, bacterial communities from healthy controls versus those with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And as you can see, they're at three different points in space. So these um, they're, you know, differ from each other and differ from healthy controls. <coughs> um, also, this is just a plot of a, a normal um, bacteria um, if bacteria in the gut of a normal person versus those in patients with IBD. And you can see that they're very skewed. Many of those similar dysbioses that we see in patients with C. difficile actually. Um, so they're looking at, there's been now um, four clinical trials of FMT to treat ulcerative colitis. And um, the results have been actually really pretty interesting. These are patients with mild to moderate ulcerative colitis and overall clinical remission with various methods. Some, um, some are just sing, you know, a couple of doses, some are intense multi-dose regimens, but um, the pooled kind of clinical remission was about 28%, which is better than 9% who got placebo FMT, and endoscopic remission was also higher. And the reason this is really kind of exciting we know our best drugs in inflammatory bowel disease, infliximab or Remicade, adalimumab, Humira, betalizumab or, or Intivio, their clinical trials showed very similar results compared to placebo. You know, they're not, none of these drugs are, are 100% effective. They all range from, you know, 20%, 30% effective, um, very similar to FMT. And so I think there's a lot of hope in patients that this may be, um, may soon become available. Um, I have to say it's not yet ready for prime time. The FDA does view FMT as an unapproved drug and only is permitting it to be done now for C. difficile um, other than in clinical trials. So that's just important to keep in mind. And a lot of work remains. Um, what's the best patient population? Are there certain populations of colitis patients who are more likely to respond? Some of the studies have suggested those with more mild symptoms or a shorter disease duration are more likely to benefit. Do they need to get pretreated with antibiotics to kind of prime their guts to receive the FMT? How does the FMT, how should it be delivered? Capsules or enemas or scopes, one dose, multi-dose? Do they need to get on then a you know, a monthly infusion, like what's going to, you know, how's this going to be delivered? And then we do certainly need longer term follow up data, and really some more mechanistic stuff to understand what's going on. Um, there are a couple studies looking at using bacteria to kill these superbugs. So will FMT potentially eradicate these multi drug resistant organisms or MDROs, including VRE, or these ESBL, E. coli infections, or MRSA, these scary things. And the CDC is sponsoring a couple of trials in that regard. And um, I want to get to the autism spectrum disorders because um, I think that this is really, really, really exciting and where this where this field is going right now. So we know that um, children with autism or patient, patients affected with autism have dysbiosis. They've been shown to have a distinct microbial composition. The bacteria in their guts are less diverse. They have increased numbers of Clostridium histolyticum. That's been found in you know multiple uh, studies and decreased amounts of other bacteria. Uh, we know that um, dysbiosis is more common in babies who are born by C-section or who aren't breastfed as often or who've had antibiotics. And, it, and then, you know, we see that babies that were born by C-section have higher ASD risk, 41%, 100% higher risk in those who um, are not breastfed, and, and some studies up to 200% higher risk in those who received antibiotics. And we know that this dysbiosis can cause a lot of local inflammation and GI distress, and prominent GI symptoms are really um, common in, in those with ASD and have correlated in some with the severity of the neurobehavioral symptoms. 
So there's this idea of leaky gut that I showed before and that these gut microbiota may just somehow influence brain function through these mechanisms. And that when you have reduced numbers of these short chain fatty acids, um, you might get some barrier disruption and some uh, leakage of either toxins or bacterial products or metabolites from the GI tract, which activate the immune system. Some of these um, cytokines or signals cross the blood brain barrier and can induce an immune response in the brain that may be somewhat responsible for symptoms. Um, more interestingly, there's a mechanism by where the vagus nerve in the gut has a direct connection up to the brain. It's one of the cranial nerves. And that there may be um, that gut microbiomes, or it's been shown that gut microbiomes um, introduce the endogenous production. So our own production of oxytocin in the human hypothalamus. We know about oxytocin, that's the feel good, that's the hug hormone, that's the one that, you know, is really involved with sociability and um, that perhaps um, altering these gut bacteria and normalizing this dysbiosis may have a beneficial effect in these kids. So um, this is a study by um, Kang et al. They're at University of Arizona um, and they published this in Microbiome in 2017. They treated 18 children with, um, they call it MMT or microbiota, transfer therapy. Um, they treated these kids with um, antibiotics for 14 days to kind of, kind of clear the way. They also gave them a bowel prep like you would do for a colonoscopy, they used movie prep. And then they had an initial oral versus an enema dose of FMT and then daily oral dosing for seven to eight weeks. <coughs> Obviously they didn't give them poop to drink. They kind of uh, put it into some kind of a shake that tasted good and, um, and, uh, they also got omeprazole capsules. This is a, a, a proton pump inhibitor that reduces gastric acid so that the acid in the stomach wasn't killing the bacteria as they, um, as they drank it. And their primary outcomes showed an 80% reduction in GI symptoms. And these were you know, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, ingestion, indigestion in these kids. Um, and really excitingly, um, though it's a small study, um, really in, uh, kind of in some dramatic improvements in behavioral symptoms that did persist after the end of treatment. And uh, going along with this, there were beneficial changes in the gut environment and they showed improved diversity and abundance of various species of bacteria that are typically um, not so present in, uh, in uh, people with ASD. So um, there've now been mouse and human studies. Um, they've had studies in mice where um, a control mouse or a germ-free mouse is um, given an FMT used in, using stool from a human donor with um, ASD and it caused ASD-like symptoms in that mouse. So you're able to kind of transfer that phenotype to an animal. They've also had um, mouse models of ASD where uh, normal stool or certain probiotics would correct those ASD-like symptoms. Then taking it into humans now, beside the Kang study, there've been three other studies, uh, two more recent with larger numbers of patients where we've seen behavioral responses in all of them and GI responses that were also positive anytime that it was actually measured or looked at. Um, so I can say, honestly, when I first started hearing of the ASD stuff a few years ago, I was skeptical. Um, you know, I never want to be someone who's a snake oil salesman and, um, you know, you know, preying on people who are desperate. Um, and so I kind of, I knew, you know, I, I was kind of holding back, but now over the past uh, couple of years, this data is really starting to to change my mind. And I really do think there, there's something here. Um, I know that there's currently a larger trial that's in planning stages. Um, and it's gonna be um, something that I know industry's um, very interested in developing like encapsulated products or more standardized products, because it's not really practical to go finding the donor how do you identify who the right donor is or, you know, how do you administer this like in a, in a real world sense? So it, it's definitely something that's being worked on. And on that level, this microbiome mania, um, when I uh, initially registered my C. diff clinical trial around 2015, there was probably like three or four FMT trials being done around the world. And the last time I looked, which was actually like, well, this is from uh, 2019, there were over 300 trials around the world, mostly in the US and Europe, um, some in Australia, but there's almost no disease that we haven't been thinking of trying FMT. And, you know, some of them are just kind of shots in the dark. Others have some real, um, you know, logic behind them. Um, but we've, you know, seen positive trials in um, in hepatic encephalopathy in patients with cirrhosis. There's been some really interesting work in bipolar disorder, um, peanut allergies is another one. Um, so I think that 
we will have treatments that this will all lead to, but it's kind of a slow process. And it's not something that you just kind of jump in and say, oh, we just do it like I do for C. diff, find a, a healthy human donor and 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 throw it in and, and it'll, it'll fix things. I mean, these are all much more complicated diseases than C. diff. And so it's probably going to take a little bit more time to get there. So if you're really interested in your gut microbiome, there's this American Gut Project. It's run by Rob Knight. He's at UC San Diego. Um, basically, they kind of crowdfunded their research. So for $99, you get a kit and you can send in a swab of your stool or your mouth or your skin for them to sequence. And they'll send you back a report. Um, I guess they'll even sequence your pets. Um, but they'll do that analysis and you'll get this really cool, colorful microbiome analysis. Um, you do um, sign consent that they can use your stool results as part of their research. And they're really like looking at different things like diet and populations of people. And, you know, they got in the U.S. and they're kind of expanding around the world. So interesting stuff there. So over 2000 years ago, Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut. And I know it's kind of cheesy, but. Um, I, you know, I think we're starting to see that he was right. And um, I want to thank you for your time. These are all the people on my team that kind of helped me get FMTs done and other collaborators that I've worked with um, around the country. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to try to get back to the to the screen. OK, should I hit stop sharing now? Um, sure. And okay. I, uh, Monica and um... And a few of the contributors have sent in some questions, and I think I'll go ahead and just pop in a few for you real quick since we're a little short on time. Um, one of them says uh, regarding engraftment, how long will this how long will this organism survive in the gut until the gut shifts, and how the microbiome will look at the end? So I guess what they're looking to see is how long does it take before these um, before they fully colonize, and how long how long would it take to see a shift in your GI in, in your experience. Okay. So what do you think? So um, I can say that, you know, the, the liter there is some literature on this in terms of like how rapidly the colonization happens and how long it persists. Um, the colonization is pretty rapid. It happens really over, you know, like over the first week. Um, and uh, bacteria strains have been shown to remain for up to six months post FMT, strains that were from the original donor. Um, as people have looked further out than that, they have found that some of these bacteria persist persist out further. Um, they do though, it's correct. It depends on what you're doing. So if you travel, if you take antibiotics, depending on what you eat, your diet can impact which bacteria stick around and which don't, you know, a lot of it has to do with diet. And so, you know, people, again, fiber being a big one and other, you know, other dietary factors can influence that travel, other infections you have. So they don't stay around forever. We know that they don't stay around forever. So this idea that you can maybe do a one and done FMT for a chronic disease, um, you know, it's one of the reasons I think that any of these other conditions, you, you know, you may be looking at something that needs to be repeated or something that needs to be done on a regular basis. Yeah. And I think on a case by case basis, it's probably different for each person, because I know <clears throat> when we did our follow up study through ASU with our MTT study, uh, after after the first um, study, two years later, we did a follow up and it appeared that my son's microbial uh, had, had just flourished and was similar to that or actually even better than that of the donor. Mm -hmm. So so with some people, if you're real careful with diet and, and whatnot, I think that it can colonize and stay just depends on each mm -hmm. person and how you treat your body. Um, the next question, I think, let's see. Are probiotics alone able to do a good shift in the microbiome? And if yes, how long does that take and how many CFUs and strains are and which strains are recommended? So it was the beginning of that question. I'm sorry. So regarding probiotics, oh. they're asking if, if maybe you can make a good shift in the microbiome with just probiotics yeah. alone. I'm not a big probiotic fan. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know what? I think the pro there's a lot of pro there's a lot of issues with probiotics. Actually, the the C diff guidelines for 2021 were just released, and I was one of the authors of that. And we actually took probiotics out of there completely because I would see patients coming into my office and they're spending hundreds of dollars on these things, and they're really not great evidence that it does much for C diff. Um, really, uh, another study just came out that shows it doesn't really do much to prevent C diff. So I don't believe in them for C diff. Um, there's been really, really mixed results and very like weak results in IBS. Um, you know, there's been some in antibiotic associated diarrhea in kids, but really when we're talking about probiotics, we're really flying blind 
there just hasn't been a lot of clinical trials. A lot of times, actually, there was one study where they went and they pulled a bunch of probiotics off the shelf and then actually tested them to see what was inside. And it didn't matter if you got like the expensive refrigerated ones from Whole Foods or if you got the generic ones. It was just like some of them had dead bugs, you know, dead dead probiotic bugs in them. Some had different things than the, the label said, um, you know. Um, and the quality is just very, you know, it's all over the place. Um, the studies haven't been done to like really kind of recommend one probiotic over another. I don't want to go so far as saying like probiotics don't work for anything, but we really, just the way the FDA classified them, um, mm. where just, it really kind of limited, um, companies are making billions and billions a year of probiotics, selling them to people and they don't have to show one ounce of data. Um, they just have to show that they're safe or, you know, that they've been produced in a certain way, you know, um, but they don't have to, um, they're not really accountable. And I really just see people spending a lot of money on them that I think would sometimes be better spent focusing on things that we really do have good data for, like diet. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, regarding pre-treatment, again, that's a good point with diet too, but regarding pre-treatment, in your opinion, are there any key pre-treatments that you would recommend to increase the likelihood of, of a successful transplant besides vancomycin? Um, so the one thing that's important to remember, um, cause yes, you, you mentioned vancomycin. So, um, I deliver FMT one of two ways I have, um, colonoscopically delivered and I also have access to the capsules. So I give some people the capsules, the washout period off of vancomycin is very important because if you administer the FMT too early, the vancomycin is still in the gut and that vancomycin floating around is very broad spectrum activity against lots of different bacteria. So it, you're essentially kind of undoing the FMT if you have any other antibiotic you know, on board, particularly vancomycin. So I've noticed particularly with the upper GI administration and the, um, the capsules, I have to have a good three day washout where they have to have no vancomycin for 72 hours. Um, everybody wants to know like, what can I do? What should I eat? You know, what's gonna make this more successful? And I really just say, you know, try to try to get back to eating like sort of, a, a more, you know, a lot of times when people have been going through C. diff, they don't feel like eating at all. They have a lot of weight, their appetite's down. Try to encourage them to, to eat a more broad um, variety of foods, particularly like a variety of plants. That's one thing Rob Knight's lab showed is the more different types of plants you eat, particularly people eat a plant-based diet. Those who eat, you know, more variety have more diversity and abundance. And we know that that's good to have that diversity of bacteria. Um, um, I do recommend sometimes I don't recommend probiotics, but I do have patients take a fiber supplement a lot of times if they're having a hard time getting in that fiber. And I see, you know, I go to all these nerdy microbiome conferences and they give psyllium fiber to a lot of these like, you know, mouse studies and psyllium fiber seems to be like, you know, food for all these good anaerobes that love to make short chain fatty acids. So I like um, Metamucil and, and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm scanning through to see if we have any there. Okay. Oh, uh... Oh, says, um, how important is it to have an FMT donor that is tailored to the needs of the recipient as opposed to being generic donors? So can we talk about that? Is it better to have, say, a sibling or a family member as opposed to a random person? Mm -hmm. um, so... When I first started doing this, I would just, you know, say, bring in somebody who's healthy and clean living and it doesn't really matter. And for C. diff, it really doesn't seem to matter as much. I mean, your C. diff, like I said, it's very basic. And as long as you bring in a donor who's healthy and um, not having diarrhea and who hasn't had antibiotics in the last uh, 90 days, because I did have a failed FMT early on when the donor had actually gotten clindamycin a couple of weeks before they donated. And so we repeated it with a different donor and it worked the second time. Um, but for these other diseases, um, ulcerative colitis, hepatic encephalopathy, some of those cirrhosis studies, um, I know that they're doing this um, with the autism study and um, kind of the planned autism study, um, trying to identify uh, donors who are enriched or who have a lot of the bacteria that are missing in the disease that you're trying to treat. So there's a particular ruminococcus species that was low in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. So for that study, they tried to identify donors whose gut bacteria had high quantities of that particular bacteria. And I know that they're working on that in other studies as well. So I don't, I think it is going to be something um, that's, that needs to be more tailored. Um, 
it's in ulcerative colitis studies, they've also um, done these like pooled donors. So like, you're not sure if this person has it or if this donor has it, you know, and this is like I said, we're in real early infancy with a lot of these, um, a lot of this work, you know, they've pooled material from multiple donors. Um, and so you're kind of sure you're getting a lot more, uh, more bacterial species if you're, you know, and so that's one thing that's been tried. Um, but this is definitely where it's headed and really what the FDA wants. Okay. The FDA does not want us running around doing FMT forever, like crude put poop in people. That's just not where they want this to stay. They really are hoping that it can be refined and it can be refined into something that's well characterized, standardized. So you know that it's, you know, something say in a capsule form, you know, it contains this many billion of this particular bacteria, or it's probably going to be some cocktail of bacteria. And I think that's really where everything is evolving towards that. I agree. And I, <clears throat> I'm hoping that maybe um, it'll be individualized, standardized as far as the testing and procedures as, as how we care for the individual patient, but individualized as far as testing that patient and figuring out what that patient needs specifically. Absolutely. So, um, so here, let's see, I have a couple more questions that, let's see. Uh, what do you know about helmet, hel helminothenic, I can't even say the word, <laughs> therapy, and its impact on microbiota? So it's one of those things, I, you know, I saw some lectures on it, and I know there was a guy in Boston who was doing that. He was doing, um, you know, infect patients with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, with a particular um, helminth or worm uh, parasite. And um, gosh, which, one, which worm was it? flatworm or roundworm, whatever it was, um, they um, had improvement in their Crohn's symptoms. And it was thought that it did something like it modulated the immune response somehow uh, locally in the gut. And there was a lot of hope on that. And then I haven't really seen anything about it as much recently. I think people were kind of disturbed by the idea, though I did have a patient who ordered worms online. It was a little sketchy. They came from like, they came in a box from China or something, wherever he ordered, it was not a U.S. derived source. And he took them and he was taking them to kind of self-treat because a lot of people do some of the self-treat and stuff and they come and I'm just be honest with me, tell me what you're doing. And we can kind of, you know, I, I need to, I think it's really important to be kind of, uh, you know, honest with your doctor about that. And we have a good relationship. So he was, and um, he started to have some <laughs> lesions on his skin. And I guess this worm as part of its life, life cycle, like, has goes to the skin somehow. And so he ended up needing an anti, I had to give him a dose or two of, um, I think it was ivermectin or something. He needed some anti uh, pair, uh, worm treatment to kind of kill off the worms that he infected himself with. But um, I won't say it's, I, I haven't seen anything about it recently. I would say maybe it, it lost, there, well, there was a little steam behind it for a while and I haven't seen a, a lot on it recently though. I mean, I think there was some interesting preliminary data. Okay. Um, so let's see, regarding the FMT it says, since since FMT is not approved in the United States for treatment with autism, what would you say to parents seeking treatment of this kind for their children overseas? Be careful. I would be careful. I mean, it's really hard, right? So as a doctor, you really want to try to help people. That's why you go into it. And you see people coming to you and they're very desperate and they see things and they really want to try. And I've been desperate. I, I, my son um, is on the autism spectrum and I brought him to a holistic doctor once and I got all these potions. I think he gave me something like rabid dog saliva <laughs> that I was supposed to give him. And my son's like, my husband's like, you're not going to give that to our son. You know, that's a biohazard, you know? So I, I understand that. Um, but there's a lot of really predatory people out there in this field right now. And I, and it's hard to tell who's who. Okay. Yes. Cause everything looks super legit. Everybody's got a real fancy website and they've got like, you know, it's just, um, I, I think you're playing with fire. And I think number one, they charge enormous amounts of money. Some of them, I'm seeing people who come and tell me they're $10,000 or $15,000 or more. Or more. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, that's, and it's not covered by insurance and it's, and it's not, and then you don't know what their methods are. Cause if you're, you know, I think it's kind of, um, I never want to be a snake oil salesman. I'm like, I believe in FMT. It works for C. diff. So I went out, I got some money from the NIH. I did a clinical trial that showed it, it works. And I keep doing the research to try to make it better and safer. And I think they need to do the same for any yeah. any disease. And I think that um, the guys in Arizona are doing it right. They're doing it all under like an IND under FDA watch. They're collecting, they're collecting data. They're watching their patients 
very carefully very to make sure very that it's carefully. And, yep. Yeah, and it's, very carefully working through the donor screening process. It's very, very careful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I just kind of think this is this is your child. I mean, this is your body, this is your child. And you just you gotta be real skeptical of some of those, especially where the prices are high. Um, I just encourage everybody to look on clinicaltrials.gov. I promise you there's a big autism study coming out. I know it's in the planning. I know it's in the works. I have some insider scoop there. And within the next probably year or two, they're going to be probably within the next year, they're going to be starting to enroll patients. Um, and it's probably going to be done at multiple sites. So to try to find a site to you, it's much better to take an airplane to Arizona than to fly down to you know Mexico or wherever to get this done. Yeah, out to another foreign country and then hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just seems like a whole lot of expense. And and I agree. I'm, I was one of those moms. I mean, how, it takes somebody with a whole lot of, um, I don't know, you got to be a little bit crazy to want to feed somebody, make your kid drink somebody's poop, you know, mm -hmm. but, but the results there for us were, were really great. So I can understand both. And then when they hear stories like mine, they run out and they're willing to fly to any foreign country to go give their kids somebody else's poop. And I just want people to know that that can be dangerous and they need to be very careful and cautious doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So moving forward, can you provide an estimated timeline of when you think FMTs would be available um, in the, in the, for besides C. diff in the U.S.? Because I, I'm not sure on that one. So that's tough. So right now there are at least three big kind of biotech companies that are working on developing a product and they all have a product for uh, C. diff that's in later stages of clinical trials. Like there's a phase three trial that completed a phase two B trial. So these are like late stage trials. They're presenting their data FDA and they've all been positive trials. So they're all like looking good. Um, one is Finch. They have a full spectrum capsule. So basically by full spectrum, it's derived from human donors. It's not poop in the capsule. They like clean it up. You know, it's basically like um, powdered just the bacteria. You know, they kind of filter everything, make just the bacteria. And that's their product. Rebiotics has an enema product that's also full spectrum stool. It's essentially stool, but given as an enema and run through the FDA. And then Series Health has kind of distilled things. They kind of use an alcohol treatment that kills off a lot of the vegetative forms of back, uh, the vegetative forms of bacteria and just leaves like specific spores. So it's kind of a very narrow spectrum product that's also encapsulated. But there's others. Um, I think once it's clinically available for C. diff, you'll see people maybe using it off-label for other things. Now, off-label use, obviously, you know, you're not going to get your insurance to pay for it most of the time, but it may be something that we see there. Also, all of these companies, and I just did another presentation about a month ago, um, they're all working on, um, I, I, they're working on products for uh, peanut allergy. They're working on products for graft versus host disease. There's many products under development for ulcerative colitis. They're looking at things for autism, hepatitis. All of this is in, you know, very early stage um, clinical trials for the most part. Um, they haven't reached those later stages yet, but once the ball gets rolling and they kind of under, you know, I think, um, I think we're going to see within the next year for sure, one of these products for C. diff approved and probably within uh, maybe three years, we're going to start to see products approved for other indications. I that's sure hope so. excessively hopeful, but that's what I'm, I mean, that's the timeline. It seems like they're really pushing this and, um, um, it seems like this ball has started rolling and there's just a lot of interest and a lot of science happening. So, yeah, I agree. I think the microbiome mania has has really gone full force and I'm excited to see what's going to happen in the future with that. I'd like to thank you so much for your time, Dr. Kelly. It's It's thank been a you. pleasure Thanks listening. I'm Thanks very, you. very thankful. So everybody, I hope you enjoyed. Tune in again. And um, thanks so much for sharing with us today. Enjoy okay. it. Okay. Take care. Bye, everybody.